Welcome back to the shop. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Aspire, which is the cam package that we use to program and operate our CNC machines. Now we're not quite finished with Lightwave yet. The 1911 model that we built last time uh, is all well and good, but it's not actually the file that we send to Aspire. We need to two 1911s side by side to make the form. And then we're gonna need some blocking, like this piece, which gives us our uh, ramp, easier insertion of the pistol, mounting hardware for the bolts, uh, and then wider sight channel, a couple other bits and pieces, and that gives us um, the exact shape that we need. And then here is that same 3D file that we just created inside of Aspire. And that's uh, all set to start generating our cut paths. Now, there's a couple of different types of CAM software. There's Aspire, uh, which we're using, and that's one of these sort of art CAM packages. It's designed to run a three axis router, maybe a lathe or an indexer. Uh, it's for woodworking, cabinet making, wood carving, signs, mm. stuff like that. And then there's Milling CAM, which is designed for cutting steel on a seven, eight, nine multi axis mill and to take all kinds of crazy things into consideration like thermal management so that you never actually negatively affect uh, the heat treat on steel. Um, all kinds of really complicated stuff on the milling CNC side that uh, fortunately we don't have to get into even though it would be super cool. So this is the interface of Aspire and here we can see our model. Uh, white is close to the surface and black is down as deep as we're going to cut. And I've got some shapes, simple shapes drawn on here. Uh, Aspire gives you a whole bunch of drawing tools, but also a whole bunch of milling tools. So for my roughing pass, I'm going to cut using this quarter inch diameter end mill, which has a perfectly flat bottom. And then to finish, I'm going to use this eighth inch ball nose cutter, which has a round cutting tip. Now there's a couple of ways to generate a roughing pass. The first is to remove the material one layer at a time. You can see where the big bit has removed an eighth of an inch of material on its way down to create a shape that can then be smoothed out with the smaller bit. And for certain holsters, that's great, like this sidecar, because we actually want two different levels of flat surfaces for the Kydex to be formed against. And being able to make those flat surfaces with our end mill, with our roughing bit, is fantastic. But this is where we start to run into some of the limitations of Aspire. Aspire lets me control how deep this roughing bit is gonna cut on each pass, but only as a whole. And I wanna be able to set each one of these levels individually. I need to make sure that this bottommost level is exactly 0.7 inches below the surface, and the next level up is exactly minus 0.525 inches. Fortunately, there's a pretty good solution for this. This right here is the raw code that Aspire spits out, and this is uh, ShopBot's own internal machine language, but it's basically abbreviated G-code, and it's very simple. So right here is the command that turns the router on, right here is the name of the pass and the size of the tool that we're supposed to be using, uh, these are the speeds that it's supposed to be going at it, and then now we have some dimensions. It goes to here on the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, and then these negative numbers are where it starts cutting below the surface of the material. And for a long time it cuts down at exactly one-eighth, then a quarter inch, three-quarter inch, half an inch, etc. And so the easiest thing that we can do here is just copy and replace this with the numbers that we would prefer it to be. And then we can go up to our next level. And that was supposed to be So now we have the code that will generate exactly what we want to see. And the reason that this works is because you can type in a machining allowance that will give you a little bit of extra material on all sides of the model. The second way to run your 3D roughing pass is simply to calculate a 3D finishing pass, but use the bigger bit. 
the bit will just move back and forth and back and forth, varying its depth in order to create the exact shape that then gets cleaned up with this little bit. And that's great because all of these flat areas are gonna end up at exactly the correct depth that I want. The problem with this method is there is no machine tolerance option. So I wanna leave a little bit more material here on the sides so that when I come and clean things up with my ball nose cutter, the finish is completely perfect. Uh, fortunately, there's a really easy workaround for that too. All you do is lie to the software and tell it that you're going to use a bigger bit than you actually have. And that leaves enough material on the sides for you to actually get the exact finish that you're looking for with your smoothing bit. Our finishing path, lots of really close lines for that smoothing bit, but only in the places where the model really needs to be smoothed out. Now all we do is we take our block of HDPE, stick it on the little prototyping machine, So here is the finished mold, and you can see the smoothed areas. This ball nose cutter is able to cut on all angles to give us pretty good curves. And if I had set the step over, uh, which is the distance between each pass, to be even smaller, we get even smoother results. But this will be perfect for the holster that we are hoping to create. So now it's time to go and do some vacuum forming. Alright, and while that is cooling, we'll work on our drill and cut paths. Something that will take the formed kydex like this, drill the appropriate holes, and cut it like this. All right, so here I have drawn the shape that we want this Ragnarok to take and specified where I want the holes. There's a bunch of drilling options. Uh, the important thing to do is that we make this cut project onto the model. So this is the path that the bit is going to take. As it comes in, drills all these green holes and then cuts out this blue shape. Okay, now for the moment of truth. All right, so there's a few dimensions to adjust. I can't believe that I'm this far off on camera. It's actually not great for a first try. Things are not off by a whole lot, but these are really the easiest dimensions to get right. Like, I know what this measurement should be and I just forgot to check it. Same with this here. I, I was literally this close to getting it right on the first try. Fortunately, this is a precise tool, so it's very easy to type in exactly the measurements that we are looking for. And save again. Okay, here is 
second try. Yes, now we're getting somewhere. That's much closer. This is the correct distance for that. These holes are lined up. Time to bend it. Double check everything, we buff it, and we bend it around the actual gun. Great. Okay, while that's cooling, there is one step that I skipped, and that is making a whole bunch of Ragnaroks on that mold for all of our fit testing. Uh, lots and lots of these with slight adjustments to how we bend them and changes to the mold. And we cut these out by hand, not on the machine. Before we actually create cut paths for the machine, we generally make uh, a fair amount of these handcrafted versions on the mold to make sure that we have the model, the fit, the retention, the friction, everything just the way that we like it. So Ragnaroks uh, are generally pretty simple shapes. There's usually only one size for every particular holster. And that's how a lot of folks do their inside the waistband holsters too. But here at T-Rex, we like a little bit more variability. So for our sidecars, we got a bunch of different options. We got our 26, we got our 19, our 17, our 17 with a threaded barrel and our 34. And that's just the slide lengths. We also have the shirt guards, you know, no guard, mid guard, mid guard with optic cut. Uh, high guard and high guard with optic cut. So that's 25 different cut paths just for the right hand sidecar and 25 for the left hand sidecar. And there's a whole bunch of other guns that we support, which means uh, that the next thing that we should talk about is file management. But that's too boring a topic, even for me. So let's ignore the thousands of cut paths that we have to manage here at T-Rex and get back to the 1911 Ragnarok. Uh, it's not finished. There's a couple of things that I have left to do with it. The main thing is lots and lots of testing. We're going to make a bunch more of these, make sure that everything that comes off the machine, everything that's getting cut, uh, is as good as this one, that the bending is consistent, and of course that it works well out on the range. It's not finished yet, but by the time this video goes live, it will be, and you will be able to buy it on our website. There is a caveat though. There are about a hundred years uh, worth of 1911s floating around and there's a number of different variants. So I can't guarantee this holster is going to work with every Colt government model that exists, let alone all the other third party stuff. So my recommendation to you, if you're interested in a versatile and sturdy OWB holster for your 1911 is buy ours. We have an excellent return policy if it doesn't work and please let me know uh, if you have any issues with your 1911. And uh, if you weren't interested in a 1911 holster and you weren't interested in the software, I really don't know why you watched this far. But maybe I can encourage you to be creative and think outside the box if you run across problems that need to be solved. Um, even if the solution is something that is as weird as lying to your CNC machine about what bit you installed in the collet. While that's cutting, let's talk about something. Uh, in the last video, a bunch of you commented that I should be using automated uh, retopology tools uh, to save myself basically all the work that I did in the last video. And uh, there are some amazing retopo tools out there. Moto, uh, 3D code is great. ZBrush probably was the best. But I still want to have the control of manually placed control points for what I'm doing. And here's why. If we look at our LightWave model, we can see that I have built it to be pretty much as clean as possible. It used to be 2 million polygons and now it's uh, 873. And the reason for that is that, let's just freeze this to see the edges that we're getting here. Very clean, very smooth. Um, the reason is that a lot of times I actually need to adjust some geometric points in order to get things to fit better um, differently from how they actually exist in real life. 
Now the 1911 is a very simple shape, but when I'm making a holster that's going to accommodate a light or possibly several different guns that are similar but really not the same shape, I want to be able to make small tweaks to the model to be able to taper and adjust the slide so that as the holster's tightness is adjusted by the hardware that's in there and is tapered from one side to the other, we're able to get exactly the retention and exactly the friction that we need to hold that gun in the holster uh, just right. And by building the geometry with that in mind, it's just easier for me to get the results that I'm looking for than having to wrestle hundreds and hundreds of points across the entire slide when all I want to do is just taper the very top of the very front or uh, on the sidecar that accommodates the XH35, I actually tapered that light in quite a bit so that it would give us kind of a spring-loaded retention on the retention points that we have there. Wow, it's very difficult to film yourself and put this together at the same time. <laughs> 